Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Ty Sharmanethrin, a Wheel of Time podcast. I am Will. I'm Sam. And we are continuing on in the fires of heaven. Mm, yes. Uh, chapter 43, I'll be walking us through. This place, this day. So this is the day of the battle with the Shida. Rand awakes and he is very thoughtful about the fact that he's about to lead a battle and thus lead people to their death. This is the first time that Rand is actually leading a charge rather than reacting to a battle that's kind of been imposed on him. So he's kind of sorrowful. He's it's it's really... sort of interesting to me. This is sort of off, off topic that we're getting this big battle scene like, you know, in chapter 43, you know, it's like this right. feels like a climax to the book ish, yeah. um, you know, but but, it, but there's still a ton of chapters left. Yeah, exactly. And and that kind of happens a few times throughout the books. But um, right, yeah, right, this is true. This is probably definitely one of the, the bigger examples because this is a pretty big battle. Yeah. An important note here is that Ran is giving the uh, Farder I Smy responsibilities away from the active battle. There he goes um, again, trying to keep him from getting killed. They are, as you would expect, not totally cool with it. Uh, but Ran says that he's the boss, so they should do what he says. <laughs> you see how that goes for you, buddy. The different clan chiefs talk with Rand, and we see some classic Aiel stoicism regarding battle. Uh, Aiel's approach to death and killing are interesting. They often say that anyone can kill and anyone can die. They don't really see either death or killing as inherently honorable, uh, but they don't fear either. Oh, right. So, yeah, they like the the real honor is gained from taking someone guy shine, right? I mean, right. that's like, you know, you, like you said, it, killing is easy, but like actually taking someone guy shine is like where the honor is gained, it seems like. Right. Ruark says life is a dream, which might give us some insight about why um, the Aiel have, are able to approach life like this. Well, life is a highway. <laughs> <laughs> might be like why they, they kind of approach battle with this, I don't know, a little a little bit of a cavalier kind of like, yeah. you know, hey, it just happens, whatever, man. You right, know? right. That makes sense. So Land shows up and also notes that Rand is wearing a sword again. Um, as we said in the last episode, Moraine pointed this out and he said, because I want to. So this is the first time he's been wearing a sword in, in a while. And Lan asks why, since he could use Sidene against whomever he fights. Yeah, he can make a power sword, you know. Right, exactly. So Rand says that he thinks it's not fair to fight people who can't channel with the power. So Lan correctly surmises that Rand plans to face Kuladin and himself. And Lan seems to think this isn't wise and encourages mm. him to <laughs> kind of hang back from the battle and act as general and strategist and offer range support to the battle via yeah, the power. Yeah, that makes a whole lot more sense. <laughs> and Rand doesn't like this idea and says, well, he won't take foolish risks, but he's not going to stay out of the battle. Well, he steps outside and the maidens show up and tell Rand that they're going to escort him and Egwene and Avian to, to this nearby tower that they've built up uh, to use the power from a distance. And he kind of looks at Lan and like, did you put them out this? And Land's like, hey, no, I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Land says, a woman is a, no less a woman, even if she carries a spear. Have you ever known one to give over? Um, <laughs> and so they're just sh shouting at him. And between their protests and Land's advice, Rand decides that it would probably be best for him to hang back and stand in the tower. Right, and, right. When he says that he's decided to go to the tower, it notes that the maidens act like it was his idea all along, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Just like, yeah, They're sure like, it was, buddy. As the car car wishes. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> um, he runs into Avienda, who is clearly preparing for battle, comments that he thought wise ones didn't participate in battles. He recalls that in battles between clans, wise ones can actually walk through a battlefield untouched and uh, thinks how most Aiel aren't even aware that wise, some of the wise ones can channel. Uh, so most of them don't even see them as a threat regardless. Right. Um, Avienda says that she is not a wise one yet. True. So, Just like Egwene is not an Aes Sedai yet. Right. So from the tower, we get a description of um, the view, which uh, makes it clear that it was really the best idea for Rand to stay up at this yeah. tower as he has a complete view of the battle. Um, Egwene and Avienda start channeling a thunderstorm into existence and start sending bolts of lightning down on the Shido at a, at a distance. And Rand's 
not one to be left out. So he's like, well, best get to killing. Yep. And uh, he starts deep frying the tops of hills that he can see miles away. And it occurs to him that indeed this was a good idea. Yes. As it's possible that they just end up killing Kuladin without even actively engaging Wouldn't in the that fight. Wouldn't that be nice? Right. So then we swap to Matt's perspective. He's saddling pips with the oh, plan of finally getting away. He's like, I'm definitely getting away. I'm getting away. I'm going to leave. I'm. You're not going to stop me. But I can't help but think about everything wrong with the strategies he sees as he mounts uh, surrounding him and starts to leave. But on his way, he sees a group of Shido and realizes that the Tyran and Kyrianen on this side of the battle will easily fall into a trap. Yeah, that... you know, it's like he has incredibly good luck until he just doesn't. And then it's the absolute, <laughs> like, there's nothing he was going to do to get away from this battle. Sorry. Exactly. You know, there's something where he uh, is attracted to battles or they're attracted to him, as we will yeah. discuss further. Yep. At first, he tries to talk himself uh, out of interference. He's like, I'm leaving. I'm going to go. It's like I said. But then he rides back and shouts for all the men to halt in the name of the Lord Dragon. Um, of course, at first, they're like, yeah, indignant about it. They're, hey, who are you? And but then the young lords from Tyr recognize him because he played cards with them, and they vouch that he's besties with the dragon. Right. Okay. I'm going to be perfectly honest. This this part gets a little hard to follow at times, where they're trying to describe where different groups of different people are. So I had to listen to it multiple times to understand it. But oh yeah, I hear that. Basically, Matt realizes not only are they on their way into a trap. They're not even where they're supposed to be, this group that he intercepts. They start calling him Lord Matt, and Matt's telling him he's not a lord. We'll never relent on that. I'm no bloody lord. And also assures himself that he's just delivering a message to these men. Just saying, hey. <laughs> right. I'm just trying to tell you to do the right thing, yeah. and I'm out of here. I've got to get out of here. I've got to go right. to Camelin or Lugard or somewhere else. Yeah, I'm just I'm 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 just here to tell you that you're heading into a trap. And he so like maintains that in his head, like throughout this whole thing just about <laughs> right it's just so funny because he at, at first and he's just like look you're heading into an ambush it's like he's just can't help himself pretty much yeah he's like but if you don't head into it they'll know that you see them and you'll lose the element of surprise so <laughs> he starts to give them a plan and to, to start ahead as if everything is normal and then be ready to take a formation called a hedgehog so i looked up the hedgehog formation and the hedgehog defense is a military tactic in which defending uh, a defending army creates a mutually supporting strong points in a defense in depth designed to sap the strength and break the momentum of an attacking army the strong mm. points are designed to be expensive for an attacker to assault although the defending positions are intended to be bypassed doing so exposes the attacker's rear echelons and the line of communications to counterattack that all sounds great. I just picture the uh, Romans or whatever with their big shields with like spears sticking out of it, like like right. to look like a hedgehog. But I know that's not right. what this is. But that's literally what I have in my head. I don't know. Well, it it, it, <laughs> might it probably is that. to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> but so that's just but, all I can think of. <laughs> but the point is, it's supposed to be a tactic where you're largely defending, and at any time they come to attack you, they're going to lose men. Right. 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 So he's saying he sends a group of them to create this hedgehog defense so that they're uh, starting to hack away at the Shido that do come attack at him. You know, some of these chapters, by the way, I, not just this moment, but a few others. You remember that before Robert Jordan was writing fantasy, he was James Rigney, a war historian and Vietnam veteran. And so, like, that's where huh. you get hedgehog defense. Yeah, I knew you know, he was a vet. I don't, I don't think I knew he was like a historian. That's interesting. Well, he also wrote historical fiction <laughs> and stuff like that. Really? And also, unrelatedly, he was a dance critic under his pen name Chan Lung. And that is a true fact. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> In case you didn't know that our, our man was a renaissance man. Yeah, um, really. Anyway, Jordan's experience at writing historical fiction comes through here as we start to see the battle strategy played out in painstaking detail, yeah. using terms and descriptions that aren't always accessible to the average reader, to be honest. But if you pause and work through them, uh, you start to recognize that regardless of whether we totally catch what's happening upon first reading, Jordan has a very firm picture of what he is painting. Uh, so it's actually worth, I would say, going back and trying to understand what's going on. This is, by the way, the point at which we also meet one of my favorite late in the game characters, Talmanis, who, who oh, we don't yeah. get a lot of in this book, but 
Yeah, he kind of becomes Matt's sidekick. For sure. Yeah. Talmanis is a uh, Kyrian and noble and turned soldier who's leading part of this rabble. And he tells Matt basically that he'll follow Matt if he leads them. Matt's sending the Tyrians to go form this hedgehog. And he's keeping the Kyrian around so that he can do this rear flank attack. Talmanis is like, sure. Yeah. If, uh, if you'll lead. And Matt's like, what? Hey, no, right. no, what? that's just no. My, this is my plan. No. I don't want to do it. I'm going to go. Yeah. I got to get out of here. But, but there's no time to fight. So Matt takes the Kyrian and holds back. Well, the Tyrians go to the hedgehog thing and uh, give a few moments while the Shido attack and come fully out into the open. He then rides with the Kyrian and to ambush the ambushers and offer support to the Tyrians. So, yeah, and it's like he realizes at some point, like, okay, I'm committed. I can't. I, I pretty much have to see this through. Otherwise, if I try to leave, I'm going to like get killed. I think he has a thought like that at one point, like, I, you know, that I'm just like, I, I there's no getting away away now, kind of. Right. <laughs> well, and, it, and I think it's a little bit of, well... You know, if you want something done right, you better do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here he is, Trust like explaining, blowhards. right, explaining the strategy, and they very quickly are like, "That sounds complicated. Why don't you handle it?" <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he shouts, "Blood and bloody ashes!" in the old tongue, <laughs> as he points his spear, signaling the start of the charge. And that's when the uh, channeler's lightning bolts begin to fall. Matt thinks things are about to get crazy. So. Yep. Brings us chapter 44, The Lesser Sadness. Rand's getting tired from wielding the power. He's been channeling for hours. Egwene and Avienda are both looking tired too, so they're taking turns. Uh, but their lightning strikes are looking more and more wild and random. There's a long period where Rand once again is thinking over the battle and looking across the battlefield and watching people fight and seeing the Shido getting close to the gate of Kyrian. He channels and throws a bunch of lightning around them, not able to avoid killing some of his own soldiers. Uh, he's beginning to feel exhausted and wonders if he'll be able to keep channeling. Suddenly a bolt of lightning hits the tower that they're standing in and it all starts to fall apart. The, uh, the way it kind of describes it is like he he grabs uh, Avienda and Egwene and kind of rides it down as it falls yeah, yeah, and like throws himself under the two of them and then he blacks out. It was, you know, just a matter of time until something like that happened. Rand awakes to Avienda talking to him, hoping aloud that he lives. He oh, gets up. she does want him to live. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he gets up and sees that there are maidens who have died from the lightning. Because the weave that the created the lightning was Sidene, he at first assumed it was Asmodian finally he betraying him. keeps thinking that. <laughs> yeah. But when he traces the weave, he realizes that it came from the West, so it had to be Samael. Right. And at first, Ran wants to immediately go after Samael, just kind of blindly. But the women kind of remind him that likely this is that's exactly what Samael wanted, since he waited until Ran had been channeling for a while and yeah, would be weakened. That's true. And Good point. So he um, ultimately listens and decides not to go after him. Uh, Avienda and, and Egwene are ready to keep fighting. Rand tells Sulin, who is leading the maidens of the spear at this point, that he intends to ride into battle. He instructs her to choose a small guard for him and let the rest stay here and see to the wounded. Sulin is clearly injured, but wants to come with him regardless. Egwene and Avienda mount up, and Rand jumps up and winces as he feels pain in his recently reopened, never healing wound. Oh, man, yeah. Kasulin and about 50 maidens follow. Um, so we swap back to Matt, who is still with the Tyrian and Kyrianan and is marveling at how he's managed to get away. It's because you're the one giving the orders, dude. Right, right. <laughs> like, That's you're, the it's only your, reason, yeah. Yeah, it's Take your luck. Credit here, yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, okay. I actually identify with this. Have you ever been part of a conversation that's been going on too long and then you keep trying to get away, but and then you respond <laughs> and then like you're like you, you just started it back up again. And then you think, "Why didn't I just what like leave and go right, like, right. okay, well, cool dude and walk off?" But it's basically that in battle form. Yeah, like yeah. each you each time, look, you know, he just keeps yeah, jumping engaging. back in. Yep. Keep yeah. seeing a, an opening, a weakness and so at this point, the the other leaders working with Matt are scouting around looking for another battle to jump into. Uh, turns out not only did they win their last scuffle, but they'd won two more battles they'd been forced into. They're a group of Shido heading their way whom they can surprise with an attack. So once again, they're forced into a battle, but this time with a group that Kuladim himself is leading. 
Matt realizes that this conflict would likely end quickly if they were to take this group out. So Matt right, gives right. orders to set up another trap. He says, I'm staying with the uh, Pikes. One of, one of the other Lordlings says, that, you know, this is no place to fight a duel if Matt is uh, thinking that he's going to fight Kooladin. But Matt thinks, you know, I, I'm not trying to fight Kooladin. No, um, I've been trying to but, get away from this craziness for a while right. now. But a few moments later, thinks that someone ought to put a spear through Kooladin's throat. Yeah. Well, there's a little bit of conflict there. Yeah, for sure. Then Matt tells the Pikes to indicate that to the Shido that they're protecting the Lord Dragon to shout, fall back and protect the Lord Dragon and stuff like that um, as as they retreat so that all the Shido's focus will be on them. Ah, um, well played. While the uh, horsemen ride over the hill from behind and take them by surprise, and it would definitely draw Kooladin's attention. And then the most frustrating perspective shift in many books. <laughs> like, no, not right this moment. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's actually a lot of frustrating perspective shifts in the latter half of this book. Yeah, yeah. So, this is certainly all one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, right at the right at the moment that you know Matt's about to face down Kooladin and his little group shift, and here's Rand. <laughs> Rand um, talking to who's himself. Just, yeah, talking to himself. <laughs> he's totally gone, crazy loose there in thoughts. Right, right. And he's he's not thinking straight. In his head, he calls Samael by his Age of Legends name, Tell Janin. He's hanging on to Sidene which is still staving off fatigue. So he doesn't really feel how tired he is, but his mind is clearly not all there. Yep. So Sulin tells him that Egwene and Avienda have gone to Moraine for healing. The way I kind of picture this is like one of the, the those scenes where there's like a ringing in his ears and like the all the noise is very oh, distant yeah and yeah mm-hmm. echoey like as right. people are trying to talk to him like so uh, he finally follows sulin back to where the wise ones and moraine are he actually sees osmodian helping with the wounded and osmodian actually sees him and seems genuinely happy that he's alive ran starts rambling about ancient battles long past and osmodian is weirded out by this yeah um, yeah you know he's, he's a little concerned stop it man stop it <laughs> Stop going crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lan approaches him and informs Rand that the battle ended at least an hour ago and that the remaining Shadow have retreated. So after a bunch more crazy loose Theron thoughts, he releases Sidene, which causes him to collapse from exhaustion. And uh, he does feel uh, Asmodian attempt to heal him with some Sidene as he passes out. Mm. Chapter 45, after the storm. After the storm. After the dadgum storm. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. So. <laughs> after the storm um so l- let's just go ahead and say this okay so we find out in this chapter that matt killed matt Kooladin. killed Kooladin, exactly yeah and, it's and it just happens like, completely just off camera yeah yeah totally totally off and stage we hear we about don't... it like you know through recount recounts of like oh this crazy thing happened yeah and i was there and i saw it like yeah we would have liked to have been there too honestly. right so um but anyway, Matt is pondering surviving multiple scrimmages throughout the day, especially since he was only ever trying to avoid the battle. Right, right. Like you do. He's looking around at the men he'd been leading through the battle who are dancing and singing Dance with Jack of the Shadows, which apparently he taught to them. Is this the new toss a coin to your witcher? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we can only hope. Uh, we can. I've got a couple of stanzas of it here. We'll sing all night and drink all day, and on the girls we'll spend our pay, and when it's gone, then wheel away to dance with Jack of the Shadows. There's some delight in ale and wine, and some in girls with ankles fine, <laughs> but my delight, yes, always mine, is to dance with Jack of the Shadows. Ah, yes, those girls and their ankles. Yeah, and the well-turned yeah. calves, too. Yes, <laughs> ankles and calves. Mm-hmm. Um, makes me wonder about Robert Jordan. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Melindra approaches and says that she knew he would seek his own honor, that he wouldn't run from battle. She's interpreting this as all Matt really was right. trying he to found the right battle to be in and right. Stirrups. Rather than like bumbling through and accidentally stumbling upon Kooladin <laughs> right. and like yep. trying to get away the whole time. And and this is where we find out Matt killed Kooladin in battle. And it's said so casually. And and the reader would just be like, hold up. 
Wait, what I'm happened? Back did I miss a chapter? Like, fate paging back through? Like, what did <laughs> I do? It's here? just Melindra is just like, I knew you'd stayed and fight, and you did a good job, and you earned a lot of G, and you killed Kooladin, and want to grab some brunch? <laughs> exactly. And, I mean, it's just like, no big deal. Right. And uh, Done, we get no. No details of how, I mean, like, did he just walk up to him and stab him? And that was it. Right. I mean, was there a, was, was there a spear on spear fight? I mean, it, come on. Something, man. God, yeah. Uh, give, give us the, the juicy details there, but oh, well, uh, this is one place where I've seen many people say that uh, the show has an opportunity to improve upon. The yeah. Book. I would strongly hope the show would actually show it. I mean, come on. That just would not go over well. <laughs> Kooladin is one of the most uh, annoying, super annoying villains. bad guys. Yes, yeah. he is. He's a liar. He's self-righteous. He's arrogant. Lots of monologuing. And, yeah. Yes. And uh, and all we get is a sideways mention that man managed to kill him in a battle of which we get r no real description. No. <laughs> so hopefully the show does remedy that. So Nelision and Telmanis come over and try to get Matt to go claim the accolades that they're band has earned for defeating Kooladin and proclaim that they'll both follow Matt from now on. Oh, much yeah. to Matt's chagrin. He's like, no, I don't want it. I don't want an entourage. <laughs> they declare him their general and say that they need to create a banner since they'll be following him now and then. Elsewhere, Ran wakes up and Avienda and Asmodian, who clearly haven't slept, are there and they inform him that Moraine healed him and then collapsed herself, though she's recovered since then. Asmodian makes some thinly veiled comments to Ran, lecturing him about almost burning himself out. Then Avienda gets onto Asmodian for lecturing Rand. <laughs> And then proceeds to lecture Rand. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Lots of lecturing happening here. Reason. Uh, Avienda eventually gives reports about where all the clans are and says the wise ones are meeting right now. She eventually explains that the remaining Shido forces escaped to the north. Rand is just as surprised that Matt killed Kooladin as we are. Right, right. And Asmodian comments that Matt is almost as remarkable as Rand, and he hopes to meet that third Tavir in Perrin one day. And Asmodian and Avienda explain that some lords try to seek an audience with him, but they were frustrated to be turned away by the wise ones and the maidens. Rand gets up and says he wants to ride into Kyrian to catch the nobles off guard and to begin seizing political control, calling that the uh, Tyran lords that are now here were the ones that sent that he uh, he sent away from Tyr because they were plotting against uh -huh. him. Um, <laughs> now so he's now deal with them again, huh? Yeah, man, he's got those guys. Oh, lovely. On to chapter forty-six: other battles, other weapons. We're sticking with Rand. Avienda doesn't approve of Rand getting out of bed, let alone going to the city to start uh, political maneuvering. He ignores her <laughs> and gets up and gets dressed. Sometimes that's the only thing you can do. Just do what you're going to do and keep walking. Right. <laughs> As Modian approaches, uh, he's cleaned up from the battle. There is a new Kyrianan man carrying the dragon banner. He notes the numerous Shido who have been taking Guy Shine, 20,000 in all. Oh, my. I don't know how he counts up that many, but uh, anyway, somebody, I think Avienda tells him, but like, who, who did that? That counting like i really want to know fair he also takes note that some of the aiel were wearing red headbands including some guy shine that have the ancient Aes Sedai symbol on them they pass kadir's wagon where moraine is examining the twisted stone doorway to mm, foreshadowing mm -hmm. he enters kyrian by the foregate and there are many people who see him and start to cheer A large crowd forms and start doing the whole messiah worship thing uh, as he's entering uh, Rand speaks to uh, tyron high lord mylan who clearly hates Rand, but is putting on a sociopathic uh, display of sy sycophantic... Oh, yeah. Like you do. ...appreciation. So glad he you're here, Lord Dragon. Mm -hmm. He invites him to the palace. Uh, Rand agrees. Rand makes a great Game of Houses play. Oh, yeah, right. They're like, here's your throne, my Lord Dragon. Yeah, so he he walks by all the all the different lords. That These are all lords that had been plotting against him in tear. And so some of them, he's like, oh, so good to see you. And then some <laughs> of them, he totally ignores. Right, and just like playing some... the game of houses by being completely 
completely he, random. <laughs> yeah. And then some of them he just like looks at angrily and you know. <laughs> right. They'll be they'll be talking and, about it for weeks. <laughs> yeah. They're all just off balance because of this. They're like, like looking, at each, <laughs> looking at each other, like so you know, now the, the the ones that didn't get a greeting are like plotting against the other ones, and it's just all well it's, played, it's, Mr. Althor. Well played. Yes. So he asks for a chair instead of sitting on the sun throne because they're like, here's your throne. He's like, he's no, like, go get me a chair from the kitchen or whatever. He's like, <laughs> uh, this throne doesn't even look that comfortable anyway. Right, right. Then he's he's looking out across all these different nobility and, and uh, soldiers. They're all separated out and into the Kyrian and the and, and the folks from Tyr. So he says, hey, everybody, sort yourself by rank rather than nation. <laughs> Height, tallest to smallest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this further upsets the apple cart. Everybody's right, like, right, right. You know, more confused because now it's like, hey, you all work for me now. So hey, you just exactly. get right over this whole business of not liking one another. And then he explains that uh, Kyrian's flag should be flown, not tears. Um, and that's met with cheers from the Kyrianen. And uh, he the also explain, are like, we've been doing stuff here, too. We've been <laughs> right. we've been helping. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he does say you can fly one dragon banner. Then the nobility from both nat- nations all step up to pledge their loyalty, mm-hmm. which it's uh, what that's worth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of like whatever. Um, sure you do. OK. Chapter 47. The price of a ship. It ain't going to be cheap, folks. <laughs> Nynaeve awakens in the menagerie. She's been having bad dreams and a lot of dreams about Egwene. Uh, this is where we get some classic Robert Jordan describing a dress rather than advancing the plot. Right, right. Uh, he, he goes into some fair detail about the dress that Nynaeve has been wearing, along with the one that she will be wearing, as well as what uh, Birgitta is wearing, and well, where's <laughs> what Elaine is wearing? Just makes and you wonder t- if he's like made dresses and it's like some former Maybe. life. Yeah, I don't Seem- know. I mean, we <laughs> the the guy is uh, is a dance critic, um, as we right, found right. out earlier. And so it turns out Elaine's been having dreams of Egwene too, and they realize that she, Egwene's probably trying to contact them. So they compare notes between the two of them. They manage to ferret out some details of what's been going on with Rand lately. They decide that Nynaeve will visit Telian Riad tonight, even though there's no scheduled meeting. So Brigitta enters and uh, as Lini says, waiting turns men into bears in a barn and women into cats in a sack. <laughs> turns out Tom and Julian have just returned from town. So they are able to come in and interrupt the cat fighting. They hadn't gotten the go, on ahead, go ahead from the Wonder Girls though. So this makes Nynaeve upset and they report writing has started. They think it's, you know, something to do with the prophet and the dragon and everybody wants to leave and get out of here. Uno shows up and reports that there is a ship Um, (laughs) all the time trying to keep from cursing um this this one is pretty funny because he he manages to do it but he just keeps going like all through it (laughs) been there uno man i've been there i hear you (laughs) Uh, but uno is worried that they can't get to it because the white cloaks have seized it then galad just shows up he's like hey i just seized you a ship (laughs) <laughs> and, and like oh okay it. Nynaeve, yeah. look what you did yeah and it turns out that uh this whole riot started when the prophet was trying to get a ship for somebody i don't know who and um the white cloaks just uh were like no no no, that's our ship i don't know whose fault this really could be but um, other than Nynaeve's. jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so Uno is like, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll get my other Shine Iron buddies and we'll escort them to the ship then. And uh, Glad agrees uh, to go with them. Uh, as they prepare to leave, Luca confesses his undying love for Nynaeve. Uh, of course. He's like, run away with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it does seem sincere. I, yeah, I feel like exactly. It yeah. It's like a lot of his, his lines are clearly have had ulterior motives. Like, but yeah, at this point it's like, no, you're leaving for real. No, don't leave. <laughs> yes. Before he even starts, Nynaeve starts to offer him gold and uh, he denies it. And Nynaeve comments that he's making eye contact with her rather than ogling her figure (laughs) while she's wearing the dress. So she's actually worried that he's sick since he's not interested in either gold or her bosom. Right, right. After he asks for her hand in marriage, she uh, turns him down. 
she tries to explain to him without explaining to him that you have no idea how deep I'm in it right now. And so like, she, cause he's trying to say, I'll protect you. And she's saying all the, all this stuff about, yeah. Okay. You no, don't you, understand. <laughs> like you yes. don't know what kind of problems I have, dude. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Your well-termed calf does nothing against the Mogedian. <laughs> Actually, that would be great if Mogedian showed up and it's like, oh, that is a well-termed calf. Just you like, know what? He like just flourishes That's his cape enough. and like turns his leg. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the ladies swoon. Exactly. Um, we swap to Elaine's perspective and have a little discussion on clothes again. And there's a there's a funny moment here where her, she asks Birgitta about the way that she looks in the uh, trousers and everything. And uh, Birgitta says, well, I mean, it works because your your bottom's so small. And that, that actually makes <laughs> Elaine angry. And she like just <laughs> walks off. Um, so uh, Elaine goes to Sarandon and asks her to come with them. Sarandon being the uh, Shan Chan uh, woman and in in the process elaine reveals her identity as the daughter heir of andor but it makes no difference as sarandon doesn't believe her <laughs> of course and, not. Yeah. elaine sure you are <laughs> <laughs> when Elaine tries to take her by force, that doesn't work out too well either, because as we know, Sarandon has already successfully offended off Nynaeve once. She's got that Sean Chan judo. It's true. So after this conversation, we find out that Birgitta doesn't believe that uh, Elaine is the daughter heir either. She's well, like straight up. <laughs> <laughs> she's straight up says, if you say so. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 48, leave takings. Uh, back to Nynaeve, who's packing. We get details of everything else in their inventory. They say goodbye and add some more loot and XP as everyone says goodbye. So they walk through <laughs> Samara, which is largely burnt and filled with corpses. They're escorted by Shanarans with Uno and Galad, even though their party is pretty well complete with a bard, a rogue, two magic users, and a legendary <laughs> warren with a plus 15 to range attacks. Oh, man. Love it. Then some guys show up to fight them for no clear reason. You know, <laughs> just, yeah, this this is like where the battle scene is just had, it had to happen. Had to happen. Yeah. And <laughs> Glad isn't even dressed like a white cloak at this point, by the way. So I mean, like they're like they're just guys that are there to fight. So <laughs> like, we're here. We're, you look like you yeah. need to fight. You have a complete party. We're gonna kick your butt. <laughs> yeah. So while the Shinarans, Tom, Julian, and Brigitta all contribute to the battle, this is the first time we get a picture of how amazing a swordmaster Glad truly is. And I hope we get this. Like I really hope we do, because up to this point, Glad's mostly been kind of irritating. Yeah, he got butt kicked by Matt. Right. And so it may not be right at this moment, but I hope we do get a moment like this, you know, maybe even earlier on that shows the dual aspect of Galad's um, righteousness alongside his effectiveness as a bringer of death. The, the the narration describes his movements as graceful and powerful. And at the end, he's standing alone among the dead more than 20 paces from the next closest ally. And I just, that picture, Heck I yeah. think it, it just looks Epic. real cool. Like, you know, him just standing there leaning off his sword and there's just this pile of dead bodies around him. So yeah. they head on to the docks to board the river serpent and they talk the captain into taking all the refugees standing there. The captain is not at all helpful and requires payment for everyone, but finally relents when he is paid. Right. On, on a chapter 49 to Boanda. This is a actually a very long chapter that is mostly filler oh yeah yeah i remember mm -hmm. lots of dialogue and yeah it is a great chapter don't get me wrong and it's all world building you get days and days of them on the river yeah you could see and, them cutting stuff like this out of the show or cutting it into oh, like yeah. a montage or whatever you know? right yeah and they realize it's a smuggler ship and which bothers elaine more than it does naive i mean this stuff yeah it, i don't see it making yeah, like we get show. more about like the captain i think and it's like Okay, right he's, just, he's yeah. a throwaway character we don't care Sorry. right you know it shows naive caring about the refugees and how she makes sure they're taken care of you get some info about the crew members and you know stories for the refugees that i mean they don't really matter an early warning sign of the slog <laughs> right yeah in the course of this uh, birgitta does find out that elaine is indeed the daughter heir and they start to resume their real names and wash the dyes out of their hair so if you had forgotten that their hairs were all dyed different colors at this point well they're not anymore so they stop at boanda and the refugees get off but the wonder girls pay for passage onto saladar 
And also we get some uh, emo naive, naive who doesn't want to go to Talayan Riyadh because she's afraid. She and Elaine go together and they don't really find anything interesting or helpful. And there's a lot of them going into the world of dreams and not really discovering anything. Jordan needed a better editor, I think, in some cases. <laughs> don't tell him that. Harriet, you know, was his editor, his uh, wife. Really? Yeah. So eventually they do once again meet up with Gawain and the Wise Ones and they get a clear update about the battle with Elaine and Nynaeve and give a report about what's been going on with them. And they finally arrive at Saladar. So at last we come down to the uh, conclusion of of this episode. And I've got a few spoiler notes. So before we get into them, spoiler warning, if you don't want to have future bits of the books spoiled, then get out now and join us for the next episode. So we talked we talked about this, but you know, a lot of people complain about the way that Sanderson handled handled some character deaths in A Memory of Light. Yeah. I know some folks didn't like Fane's death or felt like Swan and Bren got shortchanged. Compare those to Robert Jordan's handling of Cooladin's death. Yeah, and, really. And, and I'm kind of like Hey, be thankful for what we got, because it could have just completely happened off. Right, off, uh, right. Green, yeah. and we've just been like, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you got to figure that, like, those deaths were planned at the end of A Memory of Light. I mean, you know, right. they had to be in Jordan's notes. I mean, I, I can't imagine that Sanderson just was, like, wanting to kill characters off willy-nilly. Oh, for just sure, because, yeah. Because, like, you know, I, yeah, that's the, you can't put that on Sanderson. I mean... No, that's, I mean, like, I I think he did a bang-up job in, in those cases. Right. And on that note, please visit our website at tsmpodcast.com. Uh, we do have a contact form. We'd love for you to take a minute, just a minute. doesn't take long at all. Fill it out. You don't have to write a, you know, you don't have to write the fires of heaven in the contact form. You can just <laughs> write a sentence or two. Say nice things, corrections. Whatever you want to tell us, we're happy to listen and we might mention it on air. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Podcast TSM. We're on YouTube. You can check us out there. Thanks for listening. Join us next week. We will be continuing in the fires of heaven. So until then, Tyshar Manethrin.